So this is a story. So I'll tell a story form and not, not technical story. <clears throat> so what happened was 10 years back, I met an orthopedic surgeon at a biomedical engineering conference. And my life has never been the same again. <laughs> um, the first shock was that he spoke about um, his surgical failures. The second shock was that he spoke about them using engineering terms. Now, as an engineer, I don't understand medical terms like osteosarcoma, at least at that point of time, and distal femur, things like that. And I didn't expect him to use engineering terms like uh, stress concentration and fatigue failure. So that day I learned that osteosarcoma is, or bone cancer, is mainly happens in children, mostly affects um, <clears throat> the lower end of the thigh bone, that is distal femur. Um, the, at that point, the conventional solution was to amputate the leg, in India at least. And this surgeon specialized in uh, removing the tumor with part of the bone and uh, reconstructing the large gap which is left with a prosthesis. Now, <clears throat> uh, when I actually met him uh, in this conference, his uh, concern was this these processes, life and longevity, should be much more than patient's longevity because these are all children. So, okay, let me, yeah. So this is uh, what I was trying to see. So maybe I showed too much curiosity because uh, a, a few days later, he asked me to come and um, attend a surgery and he was doing this with, a, with an advanced imported device. Now it took him, if I remember correctly, it took him more than two to three hours to remove the tumor and another two, three hours to reconstruct the gap. Um, and uh, and uh, what happened in the process is within a few weeks or a few weeks to months time, these pa children, these patients were able to get back to a normal life. They're able to walk, they're able to even run, they're able to go back to school. And, um, and that was something revolutionary in my, in my opinion. So anyway, so we attended the surgery and then we walked back to his cabin and um, uh, only to find a teenage girl, I can never forget that in my life, a teenage girl waiting outside his room with a broken prosthesis inside her leg that he had implanted one year before. Now, um, I came to know that this was not an imported device but it was a, a simpler prosthesis which he had developed and got it manufactured by a local firm, manufacturing firm. So once we were alone uh, in his room, I asked him, how can you live with this? Don't you feel you have let down the patient? But as an engineer, I, could, I was very anguished. And uh, his reply kind of stunned me. I mean, he said, Ravi, I mean, I had no choice. Uh, this girl's family is poor. They can't afford the $10,000 which was required for these imported processes. Uh, I know my simpler device could break, but at least we are saving her leg until a, a, a better design is available. That was a revelation to me. So I started looking at his uh, uh, simpler devices. In fact, he showed me a box full of broken uh, implants. We started thinking about how to improve them, how do you make them more high quality, how to make them more suitable for the local population. We studied hundreds of x-rays from his hospital. We discovered that the Indian knee joint has a different shape and size than the Western population. We started looking at different ideas to improve this, um, to make it more suitable for our, 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 our population. And um, we evolved several designs. I was a CAD, uh, CAD CAM specialist, so I, I could design them on the computers. But eventually, we had to make functional devices because you want to check the form, fit, and function. You need the real, real processes. Now, the real processes um, are made in, um, this was what I attended a surgery and uh, the broken stems which I talked about. Now the real processes are made in uh, materials like cobalt chromium for the condyle portion, which is uh, this one, uh, which has to be strong and wear resistant. Uh, titanium alloys for those stems which go in, inside the bone and they need to integrate with the bone. And then you have high density polymer uh, for preventing metal to metal contacts. All these are advanced materials. All these require special processes and uh, definitely we needed some serious money to get, get ahead at that point of time. Now, three things happened um, one after another at this point. Um, I don't know, you can call it as a miracle, maybe call it as a luck. Uh, one, um, the director of a national R&D lab in Hyderabad 
virtually out of the blue walked into my office. Uh, he specialized in advanced materials and processes and he said, you need any help? I am there. Uh, he offered it just out of the blue. Second, there was a uh, brainstorming session organized by the principal scientific advisor to the government of India, Dr. R. Chidambaram. We were invited there and he asked us to come up with a technology status document about uh, medical implants. The third thing which happened that year was, <clears throat> this was in March and then that summer, uh, both the surgeon and myself got um, uh, a short visits, invitations to USA. Me in Purdue, he in Pittsburgh. Uh, we got a 10 day overlap period, got together, 10 days of no distraction. We worked together, put the document together. And I mean, it wouldn't have been possible with our commitments, uh, you know, in, in India. So we came back and after we came back, we met the principal scientific advisor, uh, showed him the technology status report. And he asked us, would you like to start a multidisciplinary project to demonstrate uh, medical implant development in the country? Our, our answer was obvious. <laughs> we said yes. And um, within three months, his office sanctioned as uh, 50 million rupees, which is $1 million. Um, we're off to a flying start, obviously. So we had three people, three main people in the team. So this doctor with the medical expertise, me with mechanical background, and this director of Hyderabad lab, with materials and manufacturing background. We got in a few more uh, engineers to support us, uh, assistants, you can say. Uh, on the next few, period, next few days, uh, months, uh, weeks, we developed many, many concepts to give these two motions. One is the flexion extension, which is the main movement, but also very important, a small degree of rotation uh, about the vertical axis, which we found later was if you don't have the rotation, it leads to stresses in the stem. And that's what was perhaps leading to the failures in the earlier simpler device, which had only one degree of freedom, the main flexion extension. So we developed this. Um, and the Hyderabad R&D lab also came up with um, uh, a, a very low cost manufacturing process by combining several processes in an optimal manner. I mean, you can say we are Indians, we'll innovate. But it came with a very nice combination of casting and machining to reduce the cost by less than one third, actually. And we also built um, knee walker testing machines on which we put the joint and it walks the joint for several millions of, of cycles, equivalent to about 10 years of walking. So you know it is safe for fatigue and wear and things like that. Uh, so this data we have submitted to the ethical committees and um, regulatory bodies in the center uh, for permission to conduct clinical trials. Uh, the idea is to implant these devices in about 100, at least 100 patients free of cost, and then follow up, and then go for regular manufacturing. Now, our team also developed um, innovative surgical instruments, because if you want a system, you need everything uh, in place. So not just the implant, but also the instruments. We innovated that. We patented that. We also developed a software for pre-operative surgery planning to select the right processes, components, and you know where to resect it, where to position it, and so on. And we have done preliminary experiments, and we have seen that these things actually help in improving the accuracy of the surgery and also reduce the total time for both planning and actually uh, the executing the actual surgery. Actually challenge the engineers and work very closely with them week after week, in fact weekend after weekend. And that was not easy because we all had full-time jobs. I mean, he as an orthopedic surgeon, me as a professor and, and the director as a full-time you know, uh, managing his, his, his organization in Hyderabad. That was the first factor. The second factor, I think, is that um, we had no external pressures at that point of time. You know, expectations were low. No one really expected us to succeed, in a sense. Um, there were no bank loans to pay back uh, because thanks to the government funding. So these two helped. But the really what helped uh, and which is technologically very important is that we use information technology tools throughout the project, right from beginning, for every aspect. I mean, we use uh, that for project management, for communicating between the team members, for product development. And you can see some of these tools here for concept design, for visualization, for stress analysis, for kinematic simulation, rapid prototyping, manufacturing simulation and planning, and, and even surgery planning, and, and inspection, quality inspection. All these we use IT tools. And that's where my previous expertise and background really helped. So that these three really helped in making sure that time was uh, time and effort were less 
and the quality also was uh, guaranteed, assured. So that's uh, the story of our uh, the, the tumor knee project. But as we have seen from previous speakers, um, countries like India need a lot of devices, thousands of devices, and they need to be affordable to the local population, right? I mean, we, we understand that. We need many devices uh, uh, for uh, diagnostics. We have seen treatment, rehabilitation. All these are necessary. And we need to innovate for the local population. The question is, can we replicate the success of our tumor knee processes for innovating other devices in the country? We have seen isolated examples, but how do we scale up in a big way is the question which I was trying to answer. Now remember, there are systemic um, challenges to be overcome, and some of these have been pointed out by other speakers. One is that there are no institutional mechanisms for doctors and engineers to come together. I think that's very well recognized. In fact, I would go one step ahead and say there are no world-class universities in India. Where are the universities where you see science and engineering and, and medicine and humanities and management and law in one campus? None. I mean, no world-class ones. And these are necessary to nurture a multidisciplinary culture. Absolutely essential. Number two, also very well recognized, obvious, is that our education system has progressed or maybe <laughs> regressed to a completely examination-oriented system. I mean, now all we look at is uh, which we want to pass by rote memory and by practice test. That is what these coaching classes are doing. Sorry about that. But that is killing the um, curiosity and creativity, two, two essential ingredients for innovation. The third is the industry, and I think maybe some of our innovators are facing the same challenge that the industry business environment is not conducive yet. I mean, the financing options are limited. Um, even, and even if you, let us say, innovate something, um, uh, you don't get to have the team members, experienced, skilled people, where they are. We have a large population, but sorry, you don't get the right skilled people so easily. And third is, even if you come up, come up with those devices, the market acceptance of locally developed products, sorry, is not very easy to, to achieve. So in the background of this, what is the way ahead? I mean, can we really still uh, innovate? Can we, can we impart the knowledge and skills and the motivation you know, to have a new generation of medical device innovators and entrepreneurs? So we try to answer the question by conducting an experiment in IIT Bombay. And that's what I'll share with you in the next, quickly, next few minutes. Um, what I did first was to kind of generalize the experience that we gained in the tumor knee processes into a uh, systematic approach for medical device development. Very simple three steps. I made it even more simpler. Define, develop, and deliver, which is now progressively defined into more number of steps and finer uh, activities. We also, for each of these uh, steps, we kind of um, we, we, we looked at uh, uh, special skills that can be imparted by training. That's very important. For example, for step two, uh, we teach them project management skills. If it's for step four, we teach them creativity and brainstorming tools. Okay. Uh, step uh, six, uh, how do you compare and select the right manufacturing route? Uh, step eight, how do you use CAD and simulation tools to, to communicate with the medical team and then get the right answer and feedback and improve it further? Now remember, some of these things are already taught in the engineering education in the country, for, because these are common to any engineering product. But these are taught as separate subjects or separate topics. They are not taught in a single course in an integrated way. So what we have done is to put them all together in a single course and bring it in the context of biomedical engineering. That's the first thing we did. So this is how we can um, kind of uh, impart the knowledge and the skills part. So that kind of taken care. Um, but the question is, uh, uh, how do we bring the mm, passion and self-motivation, you know, in a scenario where our class sizes are going up and up and up and up? Okay, this actually some of our first-year computer science classes have thousand students or eight hundred students. Okay, um, not so easy. So, so first thing we did uh, is to change the scenario. We said this is we cannot uh, have uh, impart passion and motivation if you have a scenario like this. Uh, so the fundamental change we brought in was saying that we re will remove the focus from, um, let's say, examination and, um, and attendance, which is important. Uh, we are now going technology-wise to have biometric 
attendance. You know, we, we are so solving the wrong problem, as he was saying, <laughs> wrong solution to wrong problem. So, so what we are doing is uh, first is we removed the importance on attendance and uh, and this examination thing and put the focus on collaborative learning and uh, innovation problem solving. So what we did was to put the focus on on a on a project course project which we can uh, and made that as a central theme of the whole course. Now to solve and motivate and uh, empower the students to to achieve the goal of um, project, we did again three more things. One is as you can see in the picture, brought the class size down to 10. There was one guy who really get crashed later and he was so desperate, I said, okay, one more is fine. So 11, no problem. So that is one thing we did. Second thing is I switched the thing from a typical lecture kind of a mode to a discussion table kind of a mode. So I stopped teaching. I said, here is the lecture material, come to class, we will discuss a topic in the context of your project. And project was a central theme of the course. They had to deliver in terms of the project. The third thing I did was to invite external experts. So I got, in the beginning of the course, we had an orthopedic surgeon evaluating or, or telling them about their problem definitions. In the middle of the course, we had biomedical design experts evaluating their concepts. Towards the end of the course, I had a patent attorney to evaluate the feasibility of, of, of uh, commercializing and intellectual property rights and so on. So this kind of helped in improving the participation and improving the motivation of the students. So by the end of three months, uh, these students were able to uh, understand fairly, I would say, understand the problems faced by the doctors and the patients, they were, and also the anatomy uh, related to their pro problem, like knee or a elbow or a shoulder. They were able to come up with fairly interesting solutions which were appreciated by the doctors, and the doctors in turn told them to go ahead and, and, and do more detailed work. They were able to produce prototypes, they, were, they are now understand how to take it, translate it to a uh, a fully functional device, they know how to go to make a business plan and actually translate into a proper, you know, uh, take it to society further. So, so what we have uh, seen and then understand, and these are some of the devices developed by the students in just three months. Please remember starting from scratch. Some of these may be, you know, very potential, some of them may be average, but yes, they could do it starting from scratch, nothing from nothing. So what we have shown in this um, experiment is that medical device innovation need not be an esoteric or a uh, you can say isolated expertise, isolated domain controlled by experts. Uh, it can be taught to engineers with no prior medical exposure. All they have to do is start somewhere, something with simple devices and graduate to more complex ones as they build up their own experience and confidence. All that we feel is that they need a strong will to do something that will benefit others, especially those uh, underprivileged ones who need such help the most. And also what we discover is that in the process of doing these projects, we expand our own horizons and then transform our own lives. In fact, these students are so motivated now. I mean, they want to now go ahead and work in the summer and, and take them ahead, take them to the next level. And I think we have created 10 innovators now. So one or two or three, now we have 10 more fresh people who can do some more devices. So that's our story.